about the example of Abraham of faith and repentance. And uh, Abraham is such a wonderful example to me. In fact, he was such a strong example that all true believers are called descendants of Abraham by faith. Do you know that? That if you're believers this morning, you're actually grafted in to Abraham. I remember one time Derek Prince taught this. He said that Abraham had three kinds of descendants. God said to Abraham, I'll make your descendants like the sand of the sea, the dust of the earth, and the stars of heaven. The sand of the sea is natural Israel, the Jewish people. Uh, Isaiah said that though Israel be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant will be saved. The dust of the earth is many in quantity, but no quality. Dust has no substance. That speaks of physical descendants, Jew and Gentile that were descended from Abraham, that never came to faith. But the stars of the heaven is the church. You are like stars shining in a dark place. And so I think what a wonderful privilege to be together with together. Jew and Gentile, one new man, you are descendants of Abraham by faith. And it's good to look at Abraham's example of faith. I remember years ago I was speaking at a church. And a young man came up to me afterwards. He'd accepted Christ maybe a year before. And he was so discouraged. Do you ever get discouraged in your Christian life? It started off so exciting. He loved knowing Jesus. He felt he would never have a problem again. Let me tell you this morning... If you have a problem, don't think it's not because you're not a Christian. In fact, sometimes when you become a Christian, you can have more problems. A problem is not the sign that God has abandoned you. It's a sign that you're in process. God's preparing us for heaven. And he was so discouraged, he said he was struggling with temptation. The joy and peace seemed to have left him. And he was wondering if he was even saved. And the common, this is a common problem among the people of God. I've been there many times myself. He felt beat up, defeated, and discouraged. You know, and he was even wrestling with, with if he was really a Christian. You know, uh, this is a common problem. I remember Leonard quoted uh, John Denver one time. And this is what John Denver said. He says, I tried Christ, and it didn't work. But I love what Leonard said. You may have tried Christ, but you didn't know Christ. This morning, what we want to do is when you're in the trenches, when you're in the hard place, where is Christ when you're there? How do we get this, to this place of finding God's purpose in our life when our circumstances are so contrary to us? We're struggling to find God's will. How do we stay encouraged? If it's only for one person this morning, to me it would be worth it. Because we want to encourage you this morning. Because God promises he'd never leave us or forsake us. And we're going to look at the example of Abraham, how God was with him, what Abraham did until he got his breakthrough. Uh, one of my favorite books is called Lifetime Guarantee. It's written by an author, Bill Gillum, and he can teach it much better than I can. So if you want to get the book and skip the service, it's fine with me. But um, he made this statement. He said, it is not difficult to live the Christian life. It is impossible. It's impossible for you to live the Christian life on your own. And so many Christians are striving, and they're going to redouble their efforts, and they're going to try twice as hard to serve God, and they keep falling flat on their face, and they're saying, oh, this is so hard. I'm going to try and pray more to earn God's approval. I'm going to try more to, you know, to be a better Christian. But it's, the problem is their method. Well, let me tell you something. You can't live the Christian life on your own. Jesus says, unless you abide in me, you can do nothing. You can't do anything. The key is doing it with Christ. When Peter said to Jesus, I will never, I will never deny you. He meant it. He was sincere. And at that point, he loved Jesus so much. But what he didn't realize is he couldn't do it on his own strength. That's trying to live the Christian life on your own strength. What we should say is, God, I know I'll deny you unless you give me the strength, but I don't want to deny you. That's the way to come through it. It's to say, Lord, I know I will absolutely fail because in my flesh I can do nothing. You know, the flesh never pleases God. That means our own ability to do it independent of the Spirit of God. We're going to see this morning how Abraham learned his life lessons, not through success, but through defeat. Here's the way the world teaches us. You go to school. They give you a lesson, they teach you the lesson, they ask you the question about the lesson, and then you answer the lesson. And your performance, listen to that word, 
your performance is based on how well you responded to the question. Do you know God doesn't teach us that way? God first tests us, then we fail, and then he teaches us. And guess what he does? He teaches us that we can't do anything without him. That's what he teaches us. That's God's way. And here's the good news. You are accepted in Christ for who Christ is because who you are in Christ. There's nothing you can do to earn God's acceptance. Okay? There's nothing. That's the good news. But that's only part A. If you stop there, it's an incomplete message. Because God's approval is actually conditional. He only approves what's done in Christ. And it's not about the result. It's about the method. I'll give you an example. Um, many years ago, uh, missionaries went to Africa. And they were going there in the droves in the early, in the 1800s. And many of them would never see a single convert to Christ. But their method was to do it. And in the graveyard of the missionaries, there's numbers. One, ten, nine, twenty-two. Those numbers were the days they lived after they arrived in Africa. That's how long they lived. Some, one day they died of disease. They died of all kinds of things. It was really harsh. And they went there knowing they would die. Because their method was trusting Christ as their life, not the result. The result is not approval of what you've done. You can have good results and have the wrong method. Do you know that? As long as you're... You know what the, you know what the definition of failure is? I want you to listen to this. The definition of failure is the success story without God. You can be a Christian who is successful, but if you've done it on your own strength and your own ability without trusting Christ as your life, in the, that's your reward. But if you've done things for Christ, even weekly, if your method has been, I'm going to trust Christ... The result is God's business. The method, what he does in you is your business. He's not going to force, love doesn't force himself on you. He doesn't. But that's why the way to love is sacrifice. And we're going to see that in Abraham's life message. Abraham's basic life message was righteousness by faith. And that's what he taught us. And right there in the Old Testament, God is giving us an illustration of what, that's why he's called the father of faith. It says in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, and Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. And that's the model that we have today. It's quoted many times in the New Testament as well. And that's why Abraham is our example of faith. And... So we want to make sure that we don't try to strive to earn God's approval. We submit to it. He's already accepted you. So God, there's nothing you need to do to earn God's love. But his approval is on our method of how we do things. And that means we come to God with every problem. We submit it to God. And you'll feel overwhelmed with problems sometimes. Sometimes the problem's bigger than you. Have you ever had a problem bigger than you? But that's the faith that moves mountains. It was the mountains that are standing in your way between you and God. God must have a solution, and our way is not trying to figure it out all the time, but trusting God through the problem. And that's how we find God's purpose for our life. Because it's about one thing. It's all about the heart. And if you do something and you trust God and the result is bad, don't get discouraged. Because God approves your method. You trusted him. And sometimes our failures teach us more things that we need to trust deeper in God. So don't get discouraged if the result's not right. Focus on your method, which is trusting that Christ in you is going to do it. And that's why we surrender to him, and then we walk out by faith. And if we do it wrong, he's going to teach us. That's how we learn. Remember, God tests us first. Then we often fail, or we pass. And then we learn. And have you ever noticed certain problems keep coming around? The same ones in different circumstances? Guess what? God's trying to teach us something. He's working in our life. So Abraham's life message was faith. Isaac was hope. Because he was the child of hope. He was the promised child. Isn't it amazing that Abraham, Abram, means exalted father. But he, he, couldn't, he didn't have kids. And God gave him a promise. And he waited. You know what the Bible says? He hoped against hope. When it seemed impossible, God broke through. And that's why he was such an example of patience. Faith has to endure. And faith anchors itself on the hope that God has given you in your life. Isaac is a picture of hope because he was the result of that promise. And there was a lot of uh, speed bumps on the way to that. 
He made a lot of mistakes. But you know what's wonderful? God never forsook him. God was patient. He even used his mistakes for something good. And I believe that Jacob, who turned to Israel, represents love. What a wonderful example to us. So this morning, though, I want to take a look at the life message of Abraham. God often uses the things that seem to contradict the weaknesses in our lives. You know, the things where we feel very weak in. Paul said that. He says, I delight in weakness that the glory of Christ may rest upon me. Because when I am weak, then I'm strong if I'm trusting Christ as my life to do it through me. That's method. So delight in weakness, because there's no pride. That's why Paul had a thorn in the flesh. Don't be discouraged about the problems that come if you see them as an opportunity to trust God regardless of the result. Remember, God's responsible. And by the way, don't set yourself up for failure. Don't think, well, it's always going to fail and I'll just trust God. Don't determine in advance what God's going to do. Just determine that you're going to trust God. But your focus should be Christ, not the result. And that's the big temptation. Because often, it, you know when the biggest tests come in our life? The biggest tests always come after the greatest successes. Because our guard goes down, we relax it, we think we've made it, and all of a sudden, bam, we get hit. We see this in the life of Abraham. And so if you'd like to turn with me in the Bible to Genesis, starting in verse, chapter 12, verse 1. If you have a Bible, I think they're going to shoot it on the screen here. Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless and make your name great, uh, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Welcome to the family, by the way. If you come from the nations, welcome to the family, and if you're Jewish, welcome home. So Abram went as the Lord told him, and Lot went with them. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, at the Oak of Moreh, at the time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going towards the Negev. Now when there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt and to sojourn there for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you're a beautiful woman in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me and, put, let me li and they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake he dealt well with Abram, for he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is it that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him. And they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So Abram went up from Egypt. He went and his wife and all that he had and lot with them into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and gold. And he journeyed to, from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at first, and there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. That's a complete section. He came down in obedience, and it's very interesting. He came to a place called Shechem, or Shechem, and that means your shoulders, your back, your upper back, your shoulders. 
And that's the place where you carry a burden. He came to the place where he was carrying a burden. And he came to the Oaks of Moray. Oaks in the Bible speak of righteousness. They're upright, they're strong, and they have deep roots. And in Isaiah 61 verse 3 it says, And you shall be called the Oaks of Righteousness. And Moray is the word for teacher. He was learning to have righteousness by faith in his walk. And he came to the place of the burden where God was going to teach him something. Get ready. There's a test coming. He had passed the first one. He left his father's land. And he came and he was obedient. That was a huge step. And I love what it says in Hebrews 11 about Abraham. He went out not knowing where he was going to end up. You know, so often we go to God and we want to tell him what we want to do with our lives. God, I've got my five-year plan and here's how I want you to do it. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln was once asked something very interesting. You know, he was the president of the Union during the Civil War. The South and North were both Christians. They both prayed to the same God and they both prayed for victory. And so someone asked him, which side is God on? I think that's a great question. And you know what his answer was? He responded like this. He said, most people come to God with their plans and ask him to bless them, rather than coming to God and asking for his plan for it to already be blessed. There's a big difference. When we come to God, we got to go out not knowing ultimately where we're going to end up. Well, we do it by faith. And here we see Abraham. But on the heels of this great victory, this great Sense. And he comes and he sacrificed the Lord and he's, cel he's celebrating his commitment. He is putting his flag in the sand, so to speak. And on the heels of it, there's a famine. He goes to the Negev. And he says, well, there's not, we're running out of food. I got, I got a lot of mouths to feed. But what did God say to him? He says, go to the land that I will show you. God never told him to go to Egypt. And you know, in the Bible, Egypt represents the world. Test number one for Abram in his failure was that he could not depend on the world for his provision. If you're going through a need of provision, and lots of people are, who are you depending on? Are you depending on the government? Are you depending on your employer? Or are you depending on God for your provision? No, God uses employers. God uses government. God uses all kinds of things. What I love about Howard, I talk to Howard what, almost every day, but I remember he said to me yesterday, he says, I thank God for the doctors, and I thank God for the medicines. He says, but I'm not depending on the doctors for the medicine. God can use the doctors and medicine. He can take me through this. He can heal me supernaturally. God gets to do what God wants to do. And the result gets to be God. The important thing is Howard is living this message. He is living this message. What a wonderful example to us. And so the first is what I call the provision test. Is God your God in your time of need? And again, it's not about being irresponsible. You've got to do what you've got to do. What did God say to Moses? What's in your hand? He said, a rod. He says, pick it up. Take up your responsibility. But only after you've laid it down before God and say, God, this is yours. And then you do it by God's strength. I know that my will, God's will at home after dinner is to help clean up the dirty dishes because it's what's in my hand. Right? God doesn't free you. Resting in the Lord doesn't mean lying on the couch. That's not resting in God. That's just being lazy, which I am guilty of many times. God doesn't free us of responsibility. He wants us to take that responsibility and approach it by faith. Even something simple as washing the dishes or cutting the grass. If you've got to do something, you say, oh God, I really don't want to do it. But Lord, I'm surrendering to you. I know I have to do it. So God, give me the grace, give me the strength. And you start to do it. And you do it by God's grace. It can be something simple. Now, God will do the supernatural through you. But the first miracle doesn't have to be raising someone from the dead. It could be washing the dishes. Some people see the change of a person's life in the little things. And don't despise the day of small beginnings. It takes just as much of the grace of God to do something you absolutely don't like but know you need to do as to do something wonderful. Isn't it wonderful if God can use you in the hidden place and you can say, God, I'm going to change these dirty diapers for your glory. 
I'm going to get no thanks for it. I'm going to get no appreciation for it. But God, I'm doing it for you. Now that's supernatural grace. So we don't have to look for big things. But it's his method. But here, we see that um, Abraham had to learn to trust God. In his prayer. He hadn't learned yet to trust God. You know what's interesting about the story? We don't see Abraham being rebuked by God. Did you notice that? Now he got rebuked by Pharaoh. F Pharaoh got majorly rebuked by God. But he was rebuked by the circumstances. Most of the time, and much of the time, the rebuke in our life is not that God's angry with us, but he's teaching us the circumstances reveal the heart. Be, pay attention to what your circumstances. That's why we want to develop hearing ears and seeing eyes. And this was the lesson that Paul learned. This is what Paul said from Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. For I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul said, I'm ready to go anyway. You know, some people haven't learned how to be abundant. I remember Derek Prince once said, I listened to this on tape, he says, uh, one of the few things that Christians can't handle, many Christians can't handle, or most Christians can't handle, is success. Because it would destroy them. And in God's love, he sometimes prevents people from destroying themselves with success. That's a strange thought, isn't it? I remember there was a guy that came over from the Soviet Union, tremendous Christian, tremendous testimony, and when he came here, he became successful in business and he fell away from the Lord. And it was shocking that he could go through such persecution and yet fall away. And he says he couldn't stand the, the, the persecution of money. It took him down. Isn't that a strange thought? So don't think, so if you're in any situation, know this, God loves you. God's not punishing you. He punished Jesus so he doesn't have to punish you. And what he wants you to do is love him through it, Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for good for those who love him. It's important to love God through the trial. He hasn't left you. There's nothing surprising him. He's with you in the trial. But it's interesting, you know, that when you get, you know when you make a problem, us guys, we have to fix our problems. That's why we don't take directions. We go down the wrong path. Oh, I'll, I'll figure it out. Don't, don't bother me with directions. I'm going to figure this one out myself. Well, Abraham was no different. We, you can't dig yourself out of a hole. You don't go up when you're digging a hole. You go down. So what was on the trial? He, had to, he, he now realized, oy vey, I'm stuck. I've made a mistake. I'm down in Egypt, God didn't call me, and now I've got this good-looking, cute little wife. And just in case, we probably won't happen. It's just a backup plan, Sarah. I don't worry, I'm sure Pharaoh won't ask anything. Guess what? Pharaoh asks. And now, he's taking Sarah as his wife. He lies. He lies because he's trying to fix it himself. That's, and that is the protection test, lesson number two. So he fails the provision test. Now he fails the protection test. He tries to get himself out of it by lying. And uh, Adam did the same thing. After he ate the fruit and he realized he was in trouble, he got a fig leaf to cover it up. It was a big cover-up job. Right? He was trying to hide his sin and fix himself, but you know what? You can't fix yourself. What he needed to do was he needed to repent. And the third, and so what he saw, the protection test, is that God's his protector. Do you know in Genesis chapter 15, God says this to Abraham, I am your shield and I am your exceedingly great reward. Can you imagine? That's your God. Do you know that the gods, the ancient gods, the gods of paganism were never called, they were called the gods of the sun, the gods of the moon, the gods of the stars, whatever you need, you had a god for that, right? But God in the, in the Bible said, so I'm the God of Abraham. He was the God of a person. And I love what he says. He says, I'm the God of Abraham and of the God of J Isaac and the God of Jacob. He didn't say I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said I'm the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is a God to each one of them. And God wants to be your provision and unique. Every test that they face, and they're all different, you're all different. God can be your need and be your God in your circumstances. He wants to be your God. He wants to, isn't that an awesome thought? That's how personal God, God's not impersonal, sun, moon, and stars, 
Oh, he created that. He's a personal God who knows you. He knows your circumstances. And he is right there. He is ever-present. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord who is there. And he's ever-present to be your provider, your protector. The list goes on and on. We're going to only take a short look at this because it's just so exhaustive. And what we see from this situation, that God protected Abraham, even when Abraham won. He didn't deserve it, right? He didn't deserve it. Let me tell you something. You may not be worthy of God's love. In fact, you're not worthy. And what that means is you can't earn it. Okay? But you're not worth less. You're of eternal worth. Don't think that unworthy means you're junk, that you're trash, that God loves you. You have an eternal, incredible value to God. Unworthy just means you can't earn God's love because it's too wonderful. For us to try to earn it would only cheapen God's love. Do you know that? It's too rich. It's too wonderful. So whereas you can't earn it, you are, you are worthful. And we see that in the life of Abraham. He was unworthy. He had failed. You know, if I was an employer and I found somebody unfaithful, you let them go. But God, this, he was just beginning with Abraham. He says, okay, I've taken you through these two tests. Now I'm ready to teach you. And it came the third lesson. And the third lesson is that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. We see that in Romans chapter 2, 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? What did Abraham do? He went back to the last place he heard from God. And there he offered a sacrifice. C.S. Lewis put it this way. If someone comes to a Y in the road, and they're going to a certain destination, and they take the wrong direction. To get back to the right direction, they've got to first come back to where they went off and then go back on the right road. You can't get back on the right road by keeping to go down the wrong direction. That would be driving like I usually drive. That doesn't get you back, it just gets you further away. Repentance is turning back to God. Now, Lewis Sperry Schaefer, he was a great theologian from Dallas Theological Seminary. He said this, faith and repentance are one motion. So faith means turning towards God. And by virtue of turning towards God, you're turning away from yourself. You can't separate true biblical faith from repentance. Because it's turning towards God away from self. You can have repentance without faith. You can turn away from something, but not towards God. Because there's other things to turn towards. But biblical faith is first turning towards God, and by virtue of turning towards God, you've turned against yourself. And we see this example, that here we see Abraham. He, it was repentance. He came back to the last place he heard from God, and there he offered a sacrifice. We don't go back to that last place for self-improvement, for self-help, to tell God, I'm going to do it right this time. I promise I'll never do it again. Because I guarantee you, you'll do it again. You come back to God to say, I can't fix myself, but I surrender to you, and I'm willing to do all I can. Strengthen me to do your will. Do you know that God will empower obedience? And it's a process. It takes time. We are not changed. It's a lifelong journey of obedience. We go from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And if you go back to that place and you offer yourself to God and you fall again, you go back to that place and you keep offering yourself to God until you get victory over it. Abraham went back to the place. Do you know where he went back to? The place where he last heard from God between Bethel, house of God. Do you know that Ai is from the same Hebrew word that means iniquity? Sin to bend, twist, or distort. It's translated as ruinous heap. That's caught between the flesh and the spirit. When we come into the tensions, and there's tensions in life. He was carrying a burden that he tried to fix himself that led him into the wrong path. And God was revealing, you can't carry that burden. You can't fix your problems. You've got to come to me as your source and your life. And together, we'll journey on in that place. And so, what we see then is that repentance is coming to God and trusting God as your life so that we could, we're caught between that Romans 7. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, 7. What shall we say then? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would have known sin. 
For I would have not known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin seized the opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. For the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then bring me to death? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin. Through the commandment might come sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. You hear that? He says, it's no longer I, but there's sin dwelling in me. Now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Now I just want to pause for a moment here. When he's speaking of flesh, he's speaking of the pull of sinful behavior that is pulling him. And as long as we live in this body, that's why we'll have that pull of sin. But it's not his true identity. Because it's not I'm that doing it, but sin that dwells in me. When we have indwelling sin, things that are allowed to rule, habits, really he's talking about habitual habits, they automatically by default pull us in the wrong direction. And he tells us here, um, for I want, do not want to do, uh, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me, says it a second time. For I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I serve myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And this is Paul saying, flesh can't overcome flesh. Your best efforts to try and change your behavior will not result in success. Your method has to be, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. In the cross, there's a provision for empowered obedience. And the method of empowered obedience is this. Romans 8, 6 says, For to set the mindset on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells within you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if the Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So we have the indwelling presence of sin that's pulling us. But what we have is we can submit either to the flesh or the spirit. And the only way is not self-help and fixing ourselves and trying to change ourselves. It's coming and offering a sacrifice. Sacrifice, as I said earlier, is God's language of love. And we come to the place where we acknowledge that we can't do it on our own. We submit to God and then we walk in obedience. The Bible says count yourself. Consider yourself dead to sin. Reckon yourself in the old King James. In other words, that's taking a tally. It's understanding your identity. It doesn't say, feel your way better. If you wait for your feelings to catch up, you'll never be there. Because your feelings sometimes disagree. Feelings are good. They're neutral. They're, they're not bad. They're good things. But we, we're not led by our feelings. We're led by faith based on God's objective word. And we choose to agree with God's word rather than our feelings or what our circumstances. And that's what faith is. That's what walking in the spirit is. But it comes by sacrifice. We either yield our members instruments of righteousness or yield our members instruments of righteousness. You still have a free will. God's not going to take your free will. You can still choose to sin. But what he's saying is you don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. A captive of sin. Because you've been set free. Walk in the new identity. And Abraham is our example of a man who came back to the place. And he sacrificed his will and he came and he brought offerings to God. And you know one other thing, the first things that, that we need to sacrifice? 
is the sacrifice of praise. That seems like a strange thing when you've just come, you've been beaten in battle, you're broken, and you feel completely defeated by your circumstances. That's why it's a sacrifice. And you come and you choose to acknowledge God. You thank him that he's never left you or forsake you. You thank him that no matter how far down you are, you are not defeated and that you're going to rise up by his strength and you choose to focus on him and thank him for who he is because it's only by him that you're going to overcome what you're going through. And then you say this, God, we can do it together. I can't do it without you. You'd be surprised what God can do through a willing servant and you'll be shocked. And you know what's the most amazing thing? You will never take credit for that which you know you can't do without God. There's no basis for pride. You can't say, look at me, because if they look at you, you're a mess. <laughs> you can't do it without God. And that's why Paul delighted in weakness. He understood the secret of abiding in Christ, because he understood that God is in control of everything, and all I have to do is respond by faith to God, and even if I blow it, that's why there's grace. The law says you blew it, you're condemned. Grace says, you're accepted completely in Christ, now get up and behave yourself and start doing what I've showed you to do. That's what it says. Don't make an excuse for not doing something that God called you to do, but do it through his strength. And that's what dependency, that's what abiding in the vine means. And so you take every strength. I'm starting to, and I'm trying to practice this myself. I haven't arrived, okay? But I'm arriving. And so when I face a challenge, and I get that anxiety that floats on you because of circumstances, you know? And so the first thing I do is, oh, God, that's your problem. I'm taking that burden that's on my shoulders, and I'm, I'm giving it to you. Okay, God, how are we going to get through this? Lord, your property's in trouble. How are we going to get through this, Lord? Because God is intimately involved. And that's where you find out, that's where the power of God rests, in the obedience. And look for God in the small details. Don't have to look for, sometimes we miss God because we're expecting big things, but God's in the small details. Delight in little victories. In cutting the grass and, and washing the dishes that you can't stand doing. If that's what God's put in your hand. God has given you responsibility, but take that responsibility and say, God, I'm going to do it your way now. You know, you can even do good things in the flesh. Let me give you an example. Evangelism. Evangelism done in the flesh can be very ugly. Because, and I've seen it. You're forcing people, you're pressurizing them. You know, I've seen people like manipulated to say this prayer. Because it's based on a person's need to, to, to get them saved. I see. Hey, listen, we've never saved anybody. I've never, I didn't die for their sins. I just like, I'm just a delivery boy. I'm just delivering the mail. What you want to do with it is your business. But when we start to take the responsibility, I've got to save people and I've got to do this, you're walking in the flesh. It's because it's based on method. Your motives might be good, but your method always has to be i got to do it through the power of Christ. I can't do anything independent of him. And that's submission, humility, and obedience. I know that word obedience makes me sort of, you know, it makes you cringe sometimes, right? Because we equate obedience with performance. This is not about performance. This is about God. I'm going to love you, and I can love you where I'm at. Love God in small measures, and he'll give you greater measures. If you're faithful with little, he'll make you faithful over much. This morning, if you're here, and maybe you've never heard about Jesus or understand. I want to explain to you how it says if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. But I want to tell you some good news this morning. You can be part of him. You can know the forgiveness of sins and receive eternal life. There is a place much more wonderful than planet Earth, especially London, Ontario this past winter, <laughs> that God wants to receive you into. And I want to just explain for someone who may have never heard this message. I want to explain how it works. We have to acknowledge that we've all fallen short, that we can't save ourselves. It's no different. We're all in the same boat, and that boat's sinking. And we need a savior. We need someone to save us from our sins. We need to be forgiven. And with that, God gives us a spirit, and he gives us a wonderful gift called eternal life, and the promise that he'll never leave us or forsake us. And how we receive it is we acknowledge that we, we are sinners. We thank God that Jesus Christ sent his son, died on the cross, and rose from the dead. And the third thing, which is the most important, we surrender to God. It's not good enough to have intellectual faith. A lot of people think that they are Christians because they know in their head. But the Bible says if you believe in your heart. And the heart is the seat of the emotions. It's the thing that deep down says, yes, I can't fix myself and I want to receive Jesus. I want to pray a prayer this morning for anyone here who has never prayed or can't remember prayed or you're not sure you've ever prayed. 
how to receive Jesus. Maybe only for one person. There might not be anybody here today, and that's okay. I don't mind being thorough. And I want to pray. And I'd like you to pray in your heart this prayer after me, if you mean it and if you want it. If you don't mean it, please don't pray it. This may not be your time. There's no pressure. Like I said, we're not doing this in the flesh. We're not whipping up emotions. We're simply presenting this wonderful offer based on God's truth. So I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'm inviting anyone who in their hearts would like to pray to receive Jesus. And I'll pray slowly so that you can pray in your hearts after me. Dear God, I thank you that you love me. I know that I'm not worthy. I understand that I'm a sinner. I can't ever earn your approval or acceptance. But I pray now that you will forgive my sins. And just take a moment, if there's something specific that bothers you that you need specifically to, to bring to God, just bring that to the Lord. We can wait just a moment. I thank you that Jesus Christ, your son, died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead. And now I open my heart to you, Lord. I surrender my life to you. I turn from my sin and I turn to you, God. And like Abraham, I don't know where this is going to happen, but I'm going to trust you that you can take my life and make something meaningful. I want to live your way. I want to go your way. Give me the strength to live for you. I can't do it on my own. But I thank you that you've heard my prayer. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.